Okay, so uh, like I said in the other video in regards to Jewel being sued, they're being sued by three plaintiffs. So I was able to gather all three uh, complaints. And so I'm going to share them with you in various videos. The first one I'm going to deal with is the one that was filed on April 26, 2018. This was the very first major lawsuit against Jewel. And then I have another one um, that was, I believe, filed in state court. And then the next one um, I did already, which was uh, the DP and LP, the one that I just put up, uh, I think it was yesterday, the day before. The great thing about this particular lawsuit, um, this one that was filed on April 26, 2018, um, it's, it's, you know, way ahead of schedule, so to speak. So meaning that I'm going to share the complaint with you in one separate video. And then in another separate video, I will, um, show you the, um, motion to dismiss, um, from Jewel, from Jewel's attorneys. Like I said, in the other, uh, uh video in regards to the, uh, DP slash LP suing Jewel, uh, this is really an easy one for Jewel. And they actually even speak to um, somewhat of what they actually have as far as percentages, meaning is it 50 milligrams or is it 60 milligrams? They actually speak to it in the motion um, to dismiss and to strike. There's two uh, situations going on here. The motion to dismiss is the meaning the entire complaint is, is dismissed and then they have a class action suit, which is a motion to strike. So uh, there's two things going on in this particular lawsuit. Um, so anyway, let's uh, deal with the complaint. It's very similar. In fact, the issues and the claims are like 99.4% the same as the other lawsuit, um, the DPLP um, lawsuit. So it's really not much really much difference, but nevertheless, I'm going to share this with you. The great thing about this particular lawsuit is that it has actually a hearing date, meaning it has a date to have oral argument. Um, so they are well ahead uh, into the future already in this particular lawsuit, only because it was the very first lawsuit that was filed. The also, like I said, the other great thing is that I actually have Jules response, which I can guarantee you one thing, one thing only, they're going to respond to all lawsuits just like they responded to this particular uh, lawsuit. Or they're going to respond the same way. It's pretty much their legal argument will be the same throughout anyone that attempts to sue uh, Jewel. So anyway, this is a 39-page uh, a document. I have other documents that I also uh, downloaded uh, off of pacer.gov. Anyone can make a, um, an account there. It's free, but then to retrieve the uh, documents, it's going to cost you a little money. Like to retrieve the documents on this particular case and on the Carl Cooper case, which is in the state court, it, it, after, I mean, I didn't get, I mean, I could have gotten, every single page that was ever filed on the court. But I, the key is to know what you're looking for so you don't spend money, you know, just for the hell of it, you know. So um, it cost me about $25 to retrieve all these documents. It's well worth it to me. I, you know, it's only $25. Um, it's well worth it to present this type of information uh, to YouTubers that are, are, va are uh, in the vaping community or vaping industry to uh, gather knowledge as to what's going on here um, as far as Jewel. Like I said in the other video, I don't care for Jewel. I think they don't need to have 50 milligrams of nicotine salts or benzoic acid. I don't, I don't you know, that's just, just completely stupid, okay? But legally, um, guess what? They are protected. They are protected legally. Now, after August 10th of 2018, like I explained in the other video in regards to warning requirements 
packages re, uh, package requirements by the FDA, and they actually speak about that in the motion to dismiss. Uh, um, uh, until they have to actually comply with those particular that particular date, August 10, 2018, Juul isn't really, they are not sweating the, these three lawsuits, and in fact, there'll probably be other lawsuits to come down the road, but eventually, the court's going to be like, you know, well, we understand the situation here, and they're just pretty much just wash, wash their hands of it. Um, so, I mean, like I said, I don't particularly personally think that Juul is the greatest, con uh, greatest company in vaping. In fact, I put them on a very low rung. I think they're a really bad company. I and mean, maybe if they did three milligrams, maybe 24 milligrams max nicotine salt, I can understand that. But 50 milligrams, just, you know, you're looking for trouble. But that is a moral judgment. See, that's the difference. Uh, these plaintiffs don't understand that. And the, lawyer, the law firms that represent these plaintiffs are like, well, if you give us a good retainer fee, um, guess what? Um, in fact, they probably was a... The probably the lawyers knew they're going to lose the case anyway, so they probably figure, well, what the heck, you know? Let's charge our the, the clients a uh, hundred thousand dollar retainer fee, and we'll make our money that way, because they're not going to win these suits against Jewel. It's just not going to happen. Um, uh, the law legally, legally, unfortunately, legally, Jewel's in the right. Okay. Morally, Jewel, as far as I'm concerned, is in the wrong. But what matters in a court of law is not how you feel or what you think or what you believe is right or wrong, but what is the law. So that's what we're dealing with here. So anyway, so this is the complaint. It was filed on April 26, 2018, case number 3, colon 18-CV-02. 499-WHO. And the, uh, I guess it's a, uh, I'm going to presume anyway, that this is a woman, uh, Gertrude, or Grotride, or Gutride, or maybe it's possibly, possibly a, a man. I, don't, I can't tell you. And then it's Adam, uh, so they're together, they're married. I believe they're married. Um, Anyway, and then there's um, Seth A. Seth, whatever, I don't know, um, and then Todd and Anthony. So this particular lawsuit, um, they are, um, one, one second here, wait. I just wanted to make sure I'm reading this properly. Because when I, I read it the first time, I, I, I just skimmed through it. But it's basically, I get the points, you know, because I know what I'm, lo I'm, I'm looking for, the causes of actions and things like that. But anyway... So these are actually, because I'm looking at the state board number, and I'm saying, wait, hold it here. So these are, at, the state board numbers basically um, that they're able to appear before the state court, whatever it may be, um, in, in this uh, particular lawsuit. So these are particular attorneys that are representing the clients. And this one here, this, this particular uh, law firm also is, representing DP and LP, the video that I also did just recently, a couple days ago. So they're also representing, um, but it's mainly product liability, and I'm sure they, they specialize in product liability. Um, so anyway, it's in the United States District Court, District of Northern California. So it's Bradley Colgate, an individual, and uh, Kathleen uh, McKnight, on behalf of themselves, the general public, and those similar, similarly situated. So, in other words, if you used a vape product in the past, um, and if you have uh, similar circumstances like, like these two plaintiffs, you can actually call the, these law firms up, this law firm and this law firm here, and you could say, you know, I want to join this particular class action suit. And it doesn't necessarily have to be just in California. It could be throughout the United States. And it's U.S. territories as well. 
So, I mean, I'm not, I mean, I never used a Juul product. Even if I did, I wouldn't, you know, I mean, and Juul explains it very well in their motion to dismiss. Um, but like I said, these law firms that make money, they're about all making money. Okay. Um, but that's what the class action suit means. They, and sometimes you might have here in this area where the mouse is that you might have a long list of names or they can have just have two people and then have it so others around the United States or U.S. territories can join or they just are representing on behalf of Juul Vapors. Not necessarily that Juul Vapors, um, necessarily um, everyone that Juuls, so to speak, um, agrees with this plaint uh, these plaintiffs. But they may. And let me pause this and, and show you the other um, individuals that are involved in this. One second here. I looked through my files. I realized that I didn't download uh, some others that were involved as well. But anyway, the point is, is that um, th they represent those that are similarly situated. So therefore, it's a class action complaint. They also demand a jury. They're not, they're not going to get past they're never going to see a trial and they probably won't even settle on any of the points. Um, Juul is protected, legally protected. I mean, I don't want them to be legally protected, but they are. It's the way it is. Uh, you want to blame anyone, blame the FDA. <laughs> they could have made those staggered timeline dates a little different, but they didn't. So it protects Juul. So it is, this is how it reads. Uh, I'm going to say uh, Colgate and McKnight because it's a little easier. So Colgate and McKnight, by and through their counsel, bring this class action complaint against defendants on behalf of themselves and those similarly situated for violation of the consumer protection laws of the 50 states, including sections bah, 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 of the California Business and Professions Code and the California Consumers Legal Remedies Act. Common law fraud, deceit, and misrepresentation, unjust enrichment. <laughs> Might as well just throw the kitchen sink in there for, as well. Now, I don't need to go into the introduction because I think we know what a jewel is. Um, and this is very similar in language to the other one that I just did. So there's a lot of this I don't need to do too much. Though they did throw this in here, it says the defendants specifically offer and advertise auto ship as a service that provide uh, pods at your door and savings in your pocket. This leads the jewel consumer into thinking that they can stop purchasing jewel pods at any time when the jewel pods are in fact so addictive that most users, particularly adolescent users, cannot stop purchasing them any time. You know, as far as adolescent users purchasing jewel. You need to blame adults for that. How are they having access to purchase these products? Hmm. Unless, of course, Juul doesn't have a good age verification process. Anyway, so that's one thing that's different in language than, um, than the other complaint that I did. Actually, what I'll do, and I'll do this with the other one too, so I'm not reading it all. I'll just pause it like for five seconds. The clock here. I'll, I'll do it for five seconds. You could read the page if you're so interested, and then I'll move along. You don't mind if I vape? in between five to five seconds. There's some of this stuff I don't want to read. You could read it yourself.
the the motion to dismiss pretty knocks all this stuff out. I mean, they like they even say in the motion to dismiss all the rhetoric, and that's what it is. It's just rhetoric. There's nothing legally on their side, as far as the plaintiffs are concerned. You know, this is just a way to smear Jewel, which maybe they deserve to be smeared on a moral basis, okay, on um, uh, being morally judged. But legally, legally speaking, there's not going to be a legal judgment against them. I can, I can almost guarantee that. I want to mainly get down to uh, the causes of action is really the key to all lawsuits. That's really all that matters. These are the parties that are part of this lawsuit. Defendants and plaintiffs, that is. And their their punitive damages is five is greater than five million, because they in other words, this is what could happen. Okay, so you understand this, and you might have received these things in the mail every so often. I have, and I never. I always opt out because I never had a problem with the whatever product they're dealing with, but. When it's five million and over, let's say if they hypothetically did win, which these plaintiffs are not going to win, but let's say hypothetically they did win. And let's say they went to a trial, okay? And goes for a trial or they settle. Let's say they settle for 25 million. Let's say they goes to trial and the jury uh, punitively damages uh, packs as well as a, a jewel. Um, it could be upwards of a hundred billion dollars. I mean, there's been combusted cigarette cases that they've awarded plaintiffs like fifty billion dollars. Okay, that's the chance you take when you go to trial. So that's the reason why they mainly these defendants will always usually settle. Because they could negotiate that possibility of fifty billion down to maybe twenty-five million, and then what happens? Let's say hypothetically, regardless if it's a settlement or uh, by a jury, let's say it's twenty-five million. Then they'll mail out as, and they they could figure this out. They, they'll figure it out through the database. They'll have access to um, all those that bought the jewel. They have access to, uh, to you know. I don't know how they exactly do it, but they figure it out. Um, uh, who purchased a jewel, and they will send out all these um, like postcards, like but folded up so it's for privacy reasons in the mail, and they mail it to you. And if you use the jewel, if you want to, you could have a part of this twenty-five million or whatever it is. After, of course, after the lawyers get their money, yeah. okay. Um, and it might be only maybe ten dollars, or maybe a hundred dollars, maybe five hundred. Depends on how much money is in the whole pot after the lawyers take their. Well, in other words, once the lawyers take their fees or their percentage, that's whatever money's left. There's a bulk of it that goes to, to the two plaintiffs or the names of the that are contained inside of the lawsuit or the complaint. It could be one name, well, it can't be one name, but it could be could be two names or more. So let's say if there's 20 plaintiffs that are actually named, they'll get the bulk of the money. And then all the other jewel purchasers will get whatever's left. And so that's what, when they have these class action lawsuits, when you do lose these lawsuits, or they settle them, whoever is a purchaser of the product 
will get some kind of money, regardless if you um, know about the lawsuit or you're a party to the lawsuit or you support it or whatever have you. And then they give you an option to opt out. And you normally have to do that in writing. And it happened twice to me, not, not, nothing to do with vaping. I just got these things in the mail out of the blue. And um, I wrote them a letter and said I opt out. And that was the, you know. And they, both, both those cases settled. Um, and, you know, probably would have got two, three hundred dollars or whatever the hell it was. But I never had a problem with the product. So why should I have a part of the money? So I, I, I opted out both times. But you could always, so if you're a jewel purchaser, if they did win, the plaintiffs win in this case, you could possibly win a little money. But, uh, you know, they're not, they're not going to win. Morally, they won, but not, not legally. They're not going to win legally. So substantive allegations, defendants market, advertise, and sell e-cigarettes. Juul is a leading provider of e-cigarettes and nicotine pods in the United States and abroad. The Juul e-cigarette went on sale in 2015. As of 2018, according to market reports from uh, Nielsen and Wells Fargo, Juul accounts for approximately 50% of all e-cigarette sales in the United States. And we don't really have to go through too much of that. I'll just pause the page and you can read it. And you could pause, you, you know, use the pause with your with your mouse or however you do it or TV remote or however you're watching this and then just read the complaint itself. But what, I, what I'm really want to, get to is in the other video when I do uh, Jules a motion to dismiss and to strike mainly just to, to dismiss um, that's very interesting uh, to read about that This guy here is uh, is June fourth, two thousand fifteen. <laughs> the FDA final rule wasn't even effective until August uh, August eighth of two thousand sixteen. A lot of this stuff so outdated, guys. Come on. This is basically a, really a smear campaign against Juul. Um, that's really all it is, and to have your make your moral judgment um, to jump on the bandwagon against Juul. Not that I support Juul. I think Juul is a full shit company, absolutely. But uh, legally, they're they're okay. I get into R.J. Reynolds and all, you know, this is like, like the jewel uh, uh, attorneys pointed out. It's all rhetoric. It's all just rhetoric, you know, just rhetoric, you know, it's, it's really nothing. What's this have to do with jewel anyway? It has nothing to do with jewel. None of this. It just gives you an overall of the landscape 
of from combusted cigarettes to present vaping. And you know this, uh, they're doing the patent again. I showed that in the DPLP um, um, Jewel sued um, was it um, complaint and commentary uh, video I did that on. A lot of this stuff, you know, pretty much the other lawsuit pretty much mimics this lawsuit. The even the other lawsuit even used the same graph. Why? I'll tell you why. Because that law firm, that Italian name law firm, the second law firm that I showed you with the, uh, begins with, I can't pronounce it, uh, with M, that law firm is representing this these particular clients as well as the DPLP, <clears throat> excuse me, the DPLP clients as well. So he, he's, he's pretty much copy and paste everything, you know? <clears throat> And again, with the 6%, the 60 milligrams and the 50 milligrams. And, uh, and Jewel, uh, and Jewel um, sets that straight. So even on the second cause of action, they're going to lose on as far as the other lawsuit, the DPLP lawsuit. Know, Wall Street uh, Journal reports, you know, no, no that's not going to help your case. It's not, it's not scientific evidence. Wall Street just reports what they gather in the news, you know, or from doing their news stories when they gather it in the, the however they gather it, you know, journalists and stuff. This is not hardcore facts. <laughs> you need some serious scientific studies, which we do not have. Be a waste of my time to read all this stuff. I mean, the irony of it all is, is that these plaintiffs that are under the age of 18 should not be purchasing these products anyway. So it's really irrelevant. I mean, if you're going to hold anyone responsible, you can hold the FDA responsible for screwing around with these deadlines. And then you can also hold their parents responsible. These kids should be suing their parents for bad parenting. If there is such a thing. I don't know where that would, I don't know, you know, if there's such a statute as bad parroting, but maybe there should be. And I'll give them reporters wrote, who cares about what the reporter wrote? Anyway, I'm not even gonna even, you know, even deal with it. Then they're getting the, into the Tobacco Control Act and all this. this is garbage. This is a garbage complaint. Yes, 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 yes. These are all laws. Yes, yes, yes. But they have nothing to do with Jewel. Jewel is not required to comply with any of this stuff except for the August 10, 2018 
regards the warning requirements and things of that nature. As far as uh, selling it to someone under the age of 18, that, of course, became effective August 8th of 2016. But, you know, that's either bad parroting or bad age verification uh, processes. It's not a jewel. Now, if Jewel knew that someone under the age of 18 purchased it, and they have proof of that, that is the plaintiff's attorneys have proof of that, then yes, then maybe, maybe then they'd have a lawsuit. You've got to hold the retailers, and they have. I mean, there have been jewel retailers. <laughs> One second. And like I was saying, I mean, these there's retailers that sell jewels that have received, um, they have received FDA warning letters in the mail. You know. So, you know, this is all garbage. This is garbage, a garbage complaint. All, all these two plaintiffs did was lose their money to this law firm or law firms. says here, whether defendants advertising and marketing regarding the Juul e-cigarette and Juul pods were likely to deceive class members or were unfair, whether defendants intentionally omitted material information from their advertising and marketing materials, whether defendants unfairly, unlawfully, or deceptively induced class members to purchase Juul e-cigarettes and or Juul pods using the promise that they would be able to stop purchasing Jew pods any time, whether the defendants engaged in the alleged conduct knowingly, recklessly, or negligently. <laughs> this is such crap, man. I mean, don't get me wrong. I do not care for a jewel. I would never, ever buy a jewel product. Nevertheless, nevertheless, legally, they're not going to lose in court. That'd be nice in a way. It'd be nice if Jewel lost in court because it would teach them a lesson. Unfortunately, they're not going to lose in a court of law. And they have in house lawyers that represent them like in cases like this, they retain them. They probably give these law firms like $10 million a year to take care of any case that comes, you know, against them, against Jewel. You know. And then they might maybe hire uh, a certain lawyers that specialize in certain areas of the law and pay them $5 million and just say, here is $5 million, take care of this case for me. So anyway, here's the causes of action. So the plaintiff's first cause of action, I'm not going to even go through it all, but anyway, the plaintiff's first cause of action, false advertising under California Business and Professions Code 17500 and the following, and or the similar laws of the other states in the District of Columbia. Beginning at an exact date unknown to plaintiffs, but within three years, preceding the following of this, of the class action complaint, defendants have made untrue, false, deceptive, and or misleading statements in connection with the advertising and marketing of Juul e-cigarettes and Juul pods in California. So this is all misrepresentations and all this. And, the, and Juul shows, I mean, it's true. Juul has all this information on their website. In fact, in fact, in fact, Jewel has their entire patent 
all their patents on their website. That's how I got that patent information. When I did their video on the patent, I got it from the jewel. And they, that's public information anyway, but they provide that free of charge on the jewel website. Now, so, I mean, the, as far as being, you know, having Jewel being deceptive, misleading, they're providing you the entire patent to their product, to the nicotine salts, as well as to the Jewel mod itself, to the hardware. These plaintiffs just didn't take the time to read it, or they didn't care. <laughs> this is crazy stuff, guys. I mean, I would love to see Jewel, you know, get screwed over. But, I, I, but, you know, legally, they're in the right legally. I don't really even want to go through. It's almost at the end here, but I, I just want to share a little bit of this stuff here with you. Now, they're saying here, this is interesting, but they, of course, they speak to this in their uh, motion to dismiss, and that is, it says, defendants' acts and practices lead consumers to falsely, falsely believe that, A, jewel e-cigarettes and jewel pods were less addictive than traditional cigarettes. As far as what I read on jewel website, they never made it appear that way. You knew it was 5%, 50 milligrams of nicotine salt. And not only that, their own patents on their own website explain how addictive nicotine salts or benzoic acid is. And it's comparable to, to traditional cigarettes, or maybe even more so. And it says it right in their patents. Jewel products could be used without negative health consequences. Once again, in the patent, it explains health consequences. Would be able to, uh, class members would be able to stop using and purchasing Jewel products anytime when defendants knew that to be false. They're, for one thing, they're a business. They like repeat, um, you know, the whole thing about the combusted cigarettes like R.J. Reynolds, Philip Morris, and those guys is they were able to manipulate the nicotine levels, uh, manipulate all the chemicals that are inside their combusted cigarettes for decades, for decades, to keep people hooked on combusted cigarettes. Well, it's the same thing with this. The nicotine salts are made in a lab. They're being manipulated to keep you addicted. If you read their patents, it basically says that. They're telling you that the benzoic acid is pretty much the same thing as combusted cigarettes. And if that is the case, look how addicted people were to combusted cigarettes. So of course, you're gonna, you're gonna make a, a draw a conclusion and say, yes, I'll probably be uh, addicted to nicotine salts or jewel products, uh, like I was or could have, if you never smoked combusted cigarettes, or could be uh, to uh, combusted cigarettes. It's relevant. It's all relevant. This is a bullshit lawsuit, guys. All of them, all three of them. Again, fraud, deceit, and misrepresentation. No. Just the patents alone is enough to protect Jewel. It's right, it's public information on their own website. Well, let alone if you want to search hard enough, you could find it on the United States Trademark and Patent Office website. Again, with the unfair, unlawful, deceptive trade practices. This is garbage, garbage. 
You know, when I heard about the, Jewel being sued, I thought, wow, you know, that'd be great. I'd like to see Jewel, you know, finally learn their lesson, all this, this crappy garbage they're feeding the public. But after reading all this stuff, after reading these lawsuits, I'm thinking, you know, I'm sorry to tell you guys, Jewel's going to come out ahead. And all that's going to happen to them, if, when they beat all three of these, not just one lawsuit, they're going to beat three lawsuits in the next year or two. Three lawsuits they're going to beat. Their prices, I mean, I mean it's not, well, maybe their prices, but their, their revenue is going to go through the, it's going to skyrocket. You think of 15 billion, it'll probably be 100, 100 billion in five years if they, especially if Gottlieb, FDA Commissioner Scott Gottlieb continues to extend these uh, deadlines. When Jewel comes out ahead in these lawsuits, they'll be like, uh, hey, Jewel, great, you know. You're not going to smear them for anything, though they ought to be smeared, but because, I th like I said, I think they're a crappy company. You're addicting people. It's not a it's not a uh, a nicotine dependence situation here. It's a nicotine addiction. That's the business they're in. They're no different than combusted cigarettes. The only difference is is uh, combusted cigarettes. You have a potential of dying. Now they have improved. Uh, uh, you no, know, perfect example. If someone actually died from nicotine salts or a Juul nicotine product, then maybe then. That could be serious stuff against Jewel, even a wrongful death suit. But until something like that happens, this is all garbage rhetoric crap. And then suing for punitive damages, compensatory damages. And as far as the compensatory damages, they have to prove with medical information Medical documentation they have to show that these particular this not only these two plaintiffs that but all these other uh, jewel users because it's a class action suit had health problems medical issues they went to the hospital maybe they were gasping for air maybe they it, it, I don't know it gave them heart disease whatever they have to prove this medically in documentation to the court they don't have that information. In fact, that's what, uh, what the FDA is working on to try to figure out all that information. So as far as even uh, compensatory damages, they're not even going to win. In other words, not even going to win a penny is what they're going to Not even a penny, not even a wooden nickel, let alone punitive damages, which are usually is in the millions, even possibly billions. There's a case... Um, Oh, I can't remember that. Something like P R O G E N Y or E. I think it's E N G L E Y. Something like that. And it's it's still pending in a court of law. It goes back and forth in appeals and motions and all this. But a jury had awarded um, this family that had sued on behalf of um, the lady's uh, husband died of lung cancer. And um, I think the jury, don't hold me to the exact figure, but the, the jury like awarded her something like $50 billion. $50 billion. Because of the, um, I can't remember if it was R.J. Reynolds. I think it's R.J. Reynolds. I don't know if it's that one or Benson and Hedges or it was um, Philip Morris or British American Tobacco. I can't remember which one, but what the lawsuit basically was saying is that the tobacco company knowingly, knowingly uh, deceived the public as they were manipulating all the chemicals and nicotine and the, these combusted uh, cigarettes. And um, and the jury, you know, they they agreed and they awarded the family of the deceased husband fifty billion dollars or something like that. It was in tens of billions of dollars. And of course, of course, the cigarette company keeps fighting that. It's been in court for like two or three years. It just goes back and forth in motions. 
I mean, when you, when you, I mean, they don't get me wrong. I mean, uh, you know, uh, or pick on Philip Morris, Philip Morris, tens of billions of dollars, you know, I mean, they're worth a huge amount of money, but if you get a $50 billion judgment against you, that's going to make a serious dent in your wallet. And they, so they keep fighting that, you know, but anyway, so, uh, so that's that. But this here, this law firm here where the mouse is at, is also um, representing the other lawsuit that I just did uh, a day or two ago called uh, DP uh, slash LP. And this is the same law firm. So they probably deal with um, product liability issues, stuff like that. This is a new uh, law firm here. Anyway, so I'm going to end this lawsuit because this is a really a tedious, stupid thing here because it's relative to the other lawsuit I just did, and I went into depth with that one. And the one with Carl Cooper, I'll just go swiftly through. You know, I'll just, just scroll the pages, and you could read it if you like. Um, but so anyway, this is a complaint on the part of McKnight and, uh, McKnight and Colgate. And the key to this lawsuit is that was, it was the very first lawsuit against Juul in the year 2018 that was filed. Because if you go to certain, like, certain websites in regards to vaping, it'll say, there are three pending lawsuits against Juul. And this is one of them. And this was the very first one. Anyway, um, I'm going to let you guys go. And then we'll go into the, um, the motion to dismiss and the motion to strike, and I'll put the, both of those together. Um, it's a little tedious, but um, it's interesting, a very interesting read. Anyway, um, so I'll let you guys go. Have a good one. Bye-bye.